China's ruling party, the Chinese Communist Party, marks its centenary on Thursday. And leading up to the anniversary, there have been nationwide celebrations and preparations for what will undeniably be a colossal event coated in crimson. Highlighting major milestones, the party will not only look back on the economic transformation, poverty alleviation and technological advances made over the last seven decades of its rule, but also reinforce its vision for the future. Follow the party forever is now the message on the banners, with leader Xi Jinping expected to be China's forever president. Upon the CCP's milestone, we reflect on its evolution over the last 100 years and map out what might be next for the world's biggest communist regime in power. For this, there's no one better to turn to than the renowned British historian Rana Mitter, who is a professor of history and politics of modern China at the University of Oxford, who has published numerous works on China's modern history and nationalism, including China's Good War, How World War II is Shaping a New Nationalism, published last year. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to the show, Professor. It's great to be here, uh, Seung, and welcome, uh, well, hello to you from what's a very late night or very early morning here in the United Kingdom. It's very early there in the morning, so thank you again for joining us. And well, today, China is marking 100 years since the ruling Communist Party was founded, and it's undeniably a remarkable feat, however you might feel about the party. But what unique features do you think have really enabled the CCP to remain in power for so long as a communist regime? I mean, what's made it so resilient? I think if I had to come up with one word, and of course you could use hundreds to describe the party, thousands indeed, but if I had to come up with one, it's flexibility. If you think about where that party started out in 1921, um, actually the 1st of July birthday that uh, is being commemorated today in China is a slightly artificial date. Many historians think it's actually a little later in the month, the 23rd of July, that that uh, founding date happened. But if you think about what it started out as, we're talking about a dozen, well, 13 young men gathering in Shanghai. And 100 years later, you're talking about a machine that rules China, you know, 92 million members, second biggest economy in the world, uh, most populous armed forces in the world. Flexibility is at the key. It, of course, learns a lot from the old Soviet Union back in the days of the 1920s and 30s, and then the Cold War of the 50s and 60s, but quickly turned away from that when basically that turned into an economic backwater in the disastrous Great Leap Forward of the 50s, um, an economic experiment which went wrong and starved millions of people to death, then the Cultural Revolution in which China turned inwards. And then really an extraordinary thing in the 1980s onwards, under the leader who followed Chairman Mao, Deng Xiaoping, you have a turn to capitalism. Now, the Communist Party even today doesn't really call it capitalism. It calls it socialism with Chinese characteristics. But essentially, it's one of the biggest U-turns in economic and political history. And of course, as we know, it created an astonishing economic miracle, which has been going on to this day two decades in the 80s and 90s of double digit growth, which of course has enabled China to become that huge global economy. And these days, of course, huge innovation in areas such as technology and of course, global export. So along with coercion, along with re repression, and I'm sure we'll talk about those, flexibility, I think is the key to how the party has survived for that first hundred years. And Professor, before uh, President Xi Jinping, Chinese politics seemed to have been um, focused on the stability of the party and ha building this uh, consensus sort of governance with um, Beijing seemingly playing within the rules of global norms and institutions. But with Xi Jinping, it seems that the story has changed a bit. Do you think the last 10 years of Xi has been good for the CCP in the long run? And do you think he is now the face and the future of the party? And of course, you mentioned uh, the socialism with Chinese characteristics uh, slogan there. Uh, could you tell us more about what that might mean? Well, I think it's almost certain that next year, so in 2022, Xi Jinping will go for an unprecedented third term, third five year term as general secretary of the party and, of course, president of China along with that. But his party position is really the most important of those two, along with, of course, being chairman of the Central Military Commission and being in charge of the armed forces. So is that going to be good for China and the party? Well, in the short term, it will mean that the direction of travel we see at the moment is going to carry on. In terms of stability, in terms of recovery after the pandemic, you might argue that that will mean continuity is better than southern change. But at the same time, the style of government has really changed compared to his two predecessors, 
Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao. In other words, much more is now being brought under the control of Xi Jinping himself, and also much more, as you said in your introduction, is being put under the realm of the party rather than the government. In other words, it's very much being tied to the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party itself. Well, the question then comes up, what if the economy doesn't come back? What if there is more unrest at the borders in places like Xinjiang, Inner Mongolia, Hong Kong? In those cases, there's really nowhere except Xi to turn to actually bear the responsibility. So if it goes well, if China's economy continues to do well, he manages to use the often, as we know, very hard line tactics to repress that kind of dissent at the borders in Xinjiang, in Hong Kong, then probably the general population of China, which sees the growing living standards, will say, well, that's OK. I think that they tend to be more concerned at the moment with economic growth than with liberal values. But if it doesn't go well, then Xi Jinping has put so much of the responsibility on his own shoulders, in his own name, but it's hard to see where else people will put the blame. So you could say it's a high stakes gamble. And well, we've seen tensions between the United States and China really intensifying uh, this year with America's allies taking a stand against some of the, um, the sort of governance that you just mentioned. It's a liberal style of governance and it's disregard for global norms. And there is undoubtedly a need to work with China on issues like COVID-19, the environment and building back better. And you've pointed out that it's actually in China's uh, character or DNA, as you put it, um, to contribute to the world. But do you think under Xi Jinping, uh, China has any intention to tone down its uh, current authoritarian strain of DNA um, in the face of all this confrontation against its governance? So I think there's two parts to that really interesting question, So Young. In terms of what's going on internally within China, in terms of the way in which Xi Jinping runs the country, and also anything that falls within the boundaries of China itself. So that would be, for instance, Hong Kong, where, as we know, uh, the rights of free media are being heavily constrained. We saw the shutdown of a pro-democracy newspaper, the Apple Daily, just a few days ago. That sort of thing, I have to say, I don't think is going to loosen up in any way. That's not the style of government that Xi Jinping and his government has really uh, encompassed. And I don't think they see any reason to change it. Really, ever since the global financial crisis of you know more than 10 years ago, 2008, China has felt that the rest of the world, particularly the liberal world, doesn't really have that much to teach it anymore. But I think your question probably has more flexibility in it when we think about how China deals with the outside world. China does want to influence the way that the rest of the world thinks about China. That's why they're so keen to try and influence newspapers, social media, the narrative in general in countries like Korea, in countries like Britain, in countries like the United States. But at the same time, there's also, I think, not really a desire to actually turn those countries into clones of China. The aim is not to create sort of mini Chinese communist systems in each of these countries. It's more to try and make sure that China's own interests are protected. So if those democracies remain robust, if they remain firm and say, we are going to do business with China, of course, as you say, on areas like climate change and international trade, but we're going to stick to our own liberal values at home. And that includes speaking out about things we don't like in China. I think China will grumble. I think China will moan, I think China will complain, but actually it's not, I think, going to be in a position to do something fundamental about that in a way that it will do inside its own borders. Well, it seems that China has been keen to avoid outright conflict with the United States or other countries, but how far do you think Beijing will go in terms of asserting its claims over Taiwan and islands in the South China Sea? I think that China will go as far as it thinks it can reasonably get away with, and I say reasonably, without actually provoking a major military confrontation. The reason that I think it will do that, it will try and use you know, the classic old Chinese um, traditional tactic of uh, winning without actually having to fight, so you know, slow and steady rather than sudden moves. But I think it is realizing that on both of these issues, the South China Sea and Taiwan, it runs a danger if it uses actions that are too overtly confrontational, as opposed to either very aggressive rhetoric, or which we've seen plenty of, or gestures such as flying fighters into Taiwan airspace and then fighting them out again. Why? Because I think the one thing that China really resents, and which it's very hard to overcome, is that the United States still has significant partners and allies in the Asia-Pacific region and beyond. 
So South Korea, obviously, the Republic of Korea is a country that has had a very long standing forces agreement with the United States. And there's no sign, I think, that that is likely to be ended. Japan, of course, a formal treaty ally. Taiwan is not a formal treaty ally, but the Taiwan Relations Act passed by Washington in, back in 1979 means that the United States is in a position to help Taiwan to defend itself and also leave that question a bit ambiguous, not entirely clear about how much assistance Taiwan would get if it were actually attacked by China. For that reason, my guess is that it's economic pressure rather than military pressure that's more likely to be used by China on Taiwan. You know, things like supply chains for major companies that operate uh, technology um, uh, supply chains, for instance, between Taiwan and the, and, and the mainland. And it's areas like that where I think the wider Asian region needs to look out for, for pressure. Of course, it's important to defend against military uh, um, uh, incursions, but I actually think those are less likely than the kind of economic pressure which China's huge power in the region does, of course, make possible. South Korea, of course, knows very well. Well, South Korea's definitely had a, had a, a very big taste of what that's like, the economic retaliation. And well, for most of ancient and modern histories, China has tried to maintain an influential role on the Korean Peninsula and even suggests sometimes that Korean culture is a part of Chinese history. And of course, this is a claim that former President Donald Trump also falsely made to much outrage. Um, do you think China still views Korea as a tributary state in a way? And how do you think it will aim to uh, influence developments on the Korean Peninsula? I think China still regards the Korean pen Peninsula as being a very important uh, factor within its own defense. Tributary Strait might, might be pushing it a little hard. I think, you know, there is a strong realization, actually, to some extent, a sort of envy of at least some aspects of South Korea's way of making its way in the world. I'm thinking here of the amazing South, uh, soft power that South Korea has through, you know, K-pop, through movies, you know, when Parasite won all the Oscars last year, that was, feels a long time ago before the pandemic started, but that was the big Korean news last year before uh, the world got sick. Um, you know, those sorts of things are actually noticed and very much appreciated and in some ways envied in China itself. So I think Korea shouldn't underestimate its power in that sense. But I think it serves China's ends really rather effectively to have a divided peninsula, Con um, maintaining a northern state, the, the North Korean state that remains on the border with northeast China, with what used to be called Manchuria. I think, you know, it's, it's clear to me geostrategically that China will do almost anything not to allow reunification to take place because it doesn't want an American ally, the United Korea, on its borders. But at the same time, China has a real interest in South Korea as a tech innovator, you know, li linking up with its own uh, tech innovation in many ways. It sees it as a country that's within the Western bloc, but which is both uh, susceptible to Chinese economic interests and also, of course, can be pressured in acting against Japan, as you, you will be very aware. So in the huge disputes over World War II, uh, the question of forced sex slaves uh, by the Japanese army, often known in the West as comfort women. These are issues where China and South Korea sometimes have more to say to each other than they do to Japan. And China is very aware of that difference and tries as much as it can to use that difference to uh, make alliances with Seoul and against Tokyo where it can. And well, the CCP now, it's marked 100 years since its founding. Do you see the CCP in power 100 years from now? And especially in the face of various challenges, um, do you think the party will be able to really retain its current level of popularity or legi uh, legitimacy that it's having uh, domestically, um, especially among the uh, younger generation? Well, some people have observed that the only political party perhaps in the world that's lasted as long, uh, that's lasted even longer, is actually one in the country I'm sitting in now, the British Conservative Party, which has lasted for about 200 years or more, even though, of course, uh, it's uh, very dissimilar from the Communist Party in, in other ways. But that is also part of that's shown tremendous flexibility over the years in terms of being able to reinvent itself, most recently over Brexit here in the UK. And so I think a Chinese Communist Party, something going by that name, might well be relevant uh, even for uh, certainly for decades and maybe for another century but if it is my prediction is that it can't possibly be the kind of party that exists now and in particular the very top-down authoritarian repressive nature of today's party 
I simply don't think is going to work in the decades to come where China's demographics mean that in 10 to 20 years time, rather like South Korea, rather like Japan, it's going to have a lot more older people who need pensions uh, sorting out for them. That might mean that you need more immigration into China. That will change the demographics of that country even more. And also, you know, the emergence of a much more open next generation, which has been educated overseas. Remember, the generation of Chinese leaders today are still children of the Cultural Revolution now in their 60s and 70s. But the next generations after that will be the ones who studied in America, studied overseas. That doesn't make them liberals. It won't necessarily make them Democrats, but it will make them perhaps more understanding of how the outside world can be a positive influence in China in a way that I think today's leaders still feel very fearful about. So yes, there may well be a Chinese Communist Party or some version of it in power for decades to come, but I don't think it can be the same version as today. But then in a sense, that's logical, because as we said in the beginning of the conversation, over the last century, starting from that schoolhouse in Shanghai, where those 13 men came together to found the party, the party has changed over and over again, decade by decade. I don't see why it wouldn't continue to do that decade after decade from now. Well, you've consistently said that we need to look to its uh, history to really um, map out its future. And also you've uh, mentioned that there's a need to, well, perhaps we could look to where the Chinese are putting their money and their children in order to see where they are going. So maybe that's some food for thought there. And oh, I'm afraid this is uh, all the time we have today. But uh, that was Rana Mitter, Professor of History and Politics of Modern China at the University of Oxford and author of China's Good War, How World War II is Shaping a New Nationalism. Thank you again so much for your insights. Thank you for your chance to speak to you, Sue. It's been a pleasure. And to our viewers, as always, thank you very much for watching.